my talk today, I'm going to uh, connect or try to connect uh, four things. Uh, first, I would be speaking a few lines about what mental well-being is and how mental well-being is conceptualized in anthropology. After that, the second theme I would be talking about is about this, this uh, pandemic, COVID, and I would be specifically looking at the distincting feature of this pandemic. Third, I'm going to talk about is the adversity and the crisis which pandemic has brought about on us. And fourth, I would be trying to look at the coping mechanisms and the opportunities this pandemic has provided to us. So I start with the first of the topic that is mental well-being. You all know that when we talk about mental health or when we talk about mental well-being, it's a very relative, it's a very cultural oriented concept and it varies from one culture to another how mental well-being is seen uh, in the culture. You know, if I talk about my own community, uh, there's a term called as uh, paglamo. Paglamo is a verb which uh, translated in English means insanity. And there's a saying in my folk Bengali that there is 108 different kinds of insanity in us. And uh, these 108 kinds of insanity are pronounced in each, perhaps in uh, each individual. And uh, where it is highly pronounced, we have somebody called as insane person. Uh, in the Bengali folk literature, the concept of uh, in, uh, madness is, is, uh, is con concept of uh, being sane is abnormal. That means it's a high concept. Nobody is normal. Insanity exists in all of us. Some it is pronounced, some it is there for a very short period of time. But having said this, uh, I move on to something more operational concept which would enable me to structure my thought today. Uh, when we talk about uh, mental wellness, as my earlier learned speaker, Matthias, Dr. Matthias spoke about, that it is all about how do we, how do we cope with uh, adverse. Uh, whenever we are met with any stress or whenever we are met with any adversity, uh, we react in a certain way. And how do we react is what describe our mental well-being. And this reaction this reaction to problems, this reaction to stress, uh, this has two components. Our mental well being, when we talk about our mental well being, it has two components. The first component is what is called, in fact, it has three components. The first component is our social functioning. The second component is our, our productive functioning. And the third component of our mental well-being is our individual own self in our functioning. Now, uh, to begin with, uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, productive functioning, this is about realizing our potential, realizing our potential as uh, how do we perform in terms of our role in productivity, in our work, what we are doing. Uh, how much we are able to and how much we are able to utilize our potential as a being this is all determined by our mental well-being as a social uh, functioning the mental well-being defines how do we connect with people uh, what is our relationship uh, how do we how do we play our role in society in the community in our family uh, it is how we are as a social being and the third component is about inner experiences. How do we learn? How do we emote? 
our experiences of joy. How do we define our own self, our own concept of self? What I mean to say is, uh, mental well-being is core to be uh, what we call as human. It is central to our idea of being a human being. Now, uh, having starting with this workable definition where I have taken these three components, our uh, productive being, our social being, and our inner being, our inner self being, I try to look it up in terms of the pandemic COVID-19, which we are facing today. Now I come to the second part of my deliberation where I talk about this pandemic. Well, this is not for the first time we are facing a pandemic. We have experienced pandemic as a human being before that. We know of Spanish flu and much recently about, uh, about uh, this, uh, you know, a swine flu. They were all uh, very, very, uh, very pronounced, very, 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 very uh, dangerous pandemics and which created uh, panic and fear in us. Uh, this pandemic is different from all others. And it is different in three ways. The first way this pandemic is different is in terms of our experience of this pandemic. Uh, this is first time for most of us, for most of us, most of the world, we have a virtual experience of a pandemic before the real experience. The news of the pandemic, the visuals of the pandemic, the, 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 the information about the pandemic reached to us much before the actual pandemic happened. And if you look at this, this virtual experience, as I spoke in my last webinar, and those of who were present there, uh, they can recollect that this virtual experience constituted of certain images, images which were terrifying of people dying no space to bury them, hospitals being overcrowded, patients lying on the floor. So what all it represented was, it represented a worst case scenario. This pandemic came with what is called as a worst case scenario. And this pandemic came with, in this worst case scenario, a fear, an anxiety, a panic. Perhaps human beings have never followed development of a pandemic so closely as we are able to do in this current pandemic through the media exposure of this pandemic. Now, this fear, this, this, the whole, whole, uh, virtual experience of the pandemic, what it did was that along with the actual experience which we are having of the pandemic now, uh, this has became a highly emotive pandemic in the sense that uh, this is a pandemic which has driven us emotionally. And as it has affected us, it has uh, it has it has it has driven us uh, emotionally in a way what it has done is it has it has it has it has uh, overwhelmed how we should react in a way it has affected how we have reacted to this pandemic. My submission is perhaps, perhaps I think, if we had not had this, this, this worst case scenario, if we did not have this fear overwhelming us, perhaps our response would have been much more balanced. Our response much would, would have been much, uh, uh, much, much more focused in terms of dealing 
no problem secondly uh, this pandemic would again go down in the history as something which caused massive social and economic disruption all pandemics has health impact perhaps the pronounced economic and the social disruption which this pandemic has caused and the consequences which are going to be there in days to come will go down in the history of mankind as something being unique something which we have never uh, experienced before had and third dimension i will not deal with here uh, because uh, that would not be uh, i will not be able to focus on my actual uh, topic of the thought is how it has uh, challenged some of the uh, most accepted biological paradigms regarding disease etiology of the disease epidemiology the whole concept of practice of public health the whole concept of relationship between sanitation hygiene and cleanliness and how it has changed the concept of hygiene sanitation and cleanliness from a individual a social more 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 pronounced more pronounced effect of it now i come to the third aspect of this pandemic the third aspect of this pandemic it relates to the adversity the stress and the crisis now we know all about the health crisis which pandemic has caused but i am going to deal here with the two important crises which this pandemic has brought about the first refers to the the economic adversity which my earlier speaker has also spoken about the economic uh, suffering this pandemic has caused now i will not go into the details in terms of indebtedness in terms of unemployment in terms of uh, uh, hunger what i want to deal with is is the cause of this social suffering the cause of this social suffering lies not in the disease itself the cause of the social suffering lied in the cure of this virus now we all know professor shivastav also said this in his last speech that the viruses they are the enemies they are the enemies of society they are enemies of individual and my friends in physical anthropology has told me that how this particular virus it kills it does not kill through its own lethality it kills by turning your body against you it turns your immune system to destroy its own immune uh mm, friends its own the uh, own, own own immune soldiers so all viruses that way are anti but look at the cure for this uh, what is what is the cure we have uh, what is the cure which has been proposed for this there has been three things which have been proposed for a cure first we call social distancing which extreme form is the lockdown the second which has been suggested is that uh, uh you know uh, you have to trace you have to find out who all are suffering and then then actively uh, try to try to trace them and third isolate them social isolation so these three things social isolation the social distancing and and tracing and finding out those who are who have this problem are the very cause any of the social and the economic adversity and crisis this virus has brought down on the others so the cure of some has resulted into the suffering of the others 
So this is a real question which we have to answer in days to come is the social isolation in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, its health uh, impact. What is the economic cost of this social isolation which certain sections of the population had to pay? A large section of the population has to pay for it. Now, the whole issue is, can we have had a better way? Now, let us look at the social adversity. You see, the problem with this is that it has played havoc with how we deal with stress. Whenever we, when, whenever we are faced with a problem, whenever we are faced with a stress, we resort to what is called our social support network. And it is not that this social support network it directly comes to our aid. There is something called as social buffering, which is provided by the social support network. This whole, this whole idea that we have a social support, we may actually not operationalize it during the time of crisis. But the whole feeling that there is a social support network which we can actualize, which we can operate any time which when we may need is something which enables us to face with the stress. Thus, the social processes which enable us to deal with the stress, we deal with the stress ourselves. Social supports like gossiping, like going and meeting friends, they are what provides us with the strength to bear with the stress. And thus bearing with the stress, we face the problems of this life. This virus has affected this social perceived support network, which works through certain things like actual physical contact. No amount of uh, uh, you know, uh, online calling, telephone calling, will have that kind of role in, in operationalizing this social support network as actually meeting them. The third thing uh, where it has adversely affected us is in terms of work. And again, in affecting our work, it has uh, three different effects. There are people who can work from home. There are certain work which can be done from home, for example, teaching, which we can do from home. There are people who want to work but cannot work. These are the people who are facing the greatest crisis at this point of time. So what is has drawn our attention is, is, is this whole idea of work and how work is affected because of this whole idea of isolation, this whole idea of social distancing and the adverse effect it had on certain sections of people who are not able to continue with their livelihood. And I now come to the fourth part and this deals with uh, coping mechanisms. Snowden, Frank Snowden in his book, Epidemic and Society has shown that how epidemics, they are the mirrors of the societies. How, so, how uh, epidemics, they expose the vulnerabilities of the society. This epidemic has done this very fact. It has brought to highlight the, the precariousness, the vulnerability which exists in our societies and which go unnoticed. In days to come, we have to address these vulnerabilities. At a higher policy level, I mentioned in my last talk, it comes to uh, the unorganized sector, uh, where we do not have any way to recognize them. How do we, how do we define these vulnerabilities? definition of these vulnerabilities are going to be very significant when we try to target our 
helping mechanisms, economic aid to people who are in need of help during this crisis. Now, whenever there's a situation where uh, science, when medicine, they take a back seat, as it has happened in the case of, of, of this pandemic. It is a time for diligence for uh, social, it's a time for diligence of individual. And this is what we are seeing in present times. We are seeing how individuals are coming out with innovative ways to help these vulnerable people. We are seeing the social mechanisms, for example, langars in Gurdwaras, how they are coming out and feeding these hundreds and millions of people. The question is, when we return to a new normal, can these, can these social and individual diligence uh, important role they are playing. Can it be institutionalized in certain ways? Secondly, pandemics are not just threats. Pandemics are also certain opportunities. Certain opportunities to revamp what is wrong with our society. So is the case with this pandemic. Bruno Latour, he has said that this pandemic has showed one thing. This pandemic has shown how strong will states can be and influencing many of the things. How there can be a complete shutdown. The question is, can we carry some of these positives of this lockdown in the new normal which is going to come to address some of the pressing problems which you are going to face in days to come? Ulrich Beck has used the concept of rich society. The risk society is not very far. The risk society is in now and can we handle with some of the things which we are handling the contemporary problems the ecological and the climate change issues in days to come thank you so much